Good morning, everyone. Hope you've had a great week and that you're eager to get into the Word this morning. Before we begin, let's just unite our hearts together in a word of prayer. Father, we give you thanks uh, for another week. We give you thanks for today, for the opportunity to gather together. I thank you for everyone who's tuned in online uh, this morning, Lord. We thank you for the precious gift of your word, for the freedom that you have given us, that you've granted us to open it up and to study it freely without a fear of persecution. We thank you for our time spent in Job, and I pray that as we continue to look at the book of Job this morning, that you would just illuminate the eyes of our heart, Lord, that you would give us understanding and insight, that you would speak to us through your word. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Well, turn in your Bibles to Job chapter 31. We are going to consider this morning Job's response to his suffering and how he has been handling it here uh, throughout the course of the book. We looked, uh, we looked at the beginning about how he originally responded to his, his suffering. He said the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Well, his attitude changed a little bit after that, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. We've looked at what Job's three friends have had to say about the suffering that he was experiencing. We're going to look at what Job himself has to say about it. I begin with a quote from Paul Tripp in his book on suffering. It's a wonderful book. If you ever get a chance to read it, I would encourage you to do so. He said this, you never just suffer the thing that you're suffering, but you always also suffer the way that you're suffering that thing. I'll read that again. You never just suffer the thing that you're suffering, but you always also suffer the way that you're suffering that thing. Now, what exactly does he mean by that? Well, simply put, each one of us has a certain uh, lens through which we view the world. We have certain beliefs and assumptions about life that we take into uh, that we take with us into the valley of suffering that we have to wrestle with while we are we are in that valley. So, for example, if your identity is attached to your job and you lose your job, you're not all you are not just going to suffer the loss of your job. You're also going to suffer the loss of your identity because your identity was attached to your job. If you think that you're always going to have your physical health, uh, well, if you wake up one morning and discover that you have a heart, you've had a heart attack or you have cancer, uh, you're not only going to suffer the loss of your physical health, you're also going to suffer your expectation, the expectation you had of good health. That expectation is coming crashing to the ground now, and you're going to suffer the loss of that expectation. If you didn't have that expectation in the first place, if you didn't always expect to have good physical health, well, you wouldn't be suffering that expectation. But because you expect it to always be in good health, uh, that is something you're going to have to work through. It's not just the fact that you lost your physical health. It's the fact that you're losing that expectation, that it's come crashing to the ground. Uh, if you think that because God loves you that you're never going to suffer, uh, well, when the time does come that you do suffer, uh, you're going to have to suffer uh, through your false expectations, your false understanding of God and of what His love for you looks like. It's not just the suffering, but it's going to also be the expectations, the beliefs that you have that you're going to have to wrestle with in your suffering. And that, in a lot of cases, it compounds our suffering makes it all the more worse. And this was the case with Job. He wasn't just suffering the loss of his livestock, the loss of his children, the loss of his servants, the loss of his physical health. He was also suffering even more so because of his understanding of God and his understanding of suffering. So we're going to read uh, chapter 31 together. We're going to read the entire thing, actually, all the way through from verse 1 to verse 40. So let's read it together. This is from the NIV. This is Job speaking. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. 
For what is our lot from God above, our heritage from the Almighty on high? Is it not ruin for the wicked, disaster for those who do wrong? Does he not see my ways and count my every step? If I have walked with falsehood or my foot has hurried after deceit, let God weigh me in honest scales and he will know that I am blameless. If my steps have turned from the path, if my heart has been led by my eyes, or if my hands have been defiled, then may others eat what I have sown, and, my crop, and, my, and may my crops be uprooted. If my heart has been enticed by a woman, or if I have lurked at my neighbor's door, then may my wife grind another man's grain, and may other men sleep with her. For that would have been wicked, a sin to be judged. It is a fire that burns to destruction. It would have uprooted my harvest. If I have denied justice to any of my servants, whether male or female, when they had a grievance against me, what will I do when God confronts me? What will I answer when called to account? Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one form us both within our, our mothers? If I have denied the desires of the poor, or let the eyes of the widow grow weary, if I have kept my bread to myself, not sharing it with the fatherless, but from my youth I reared them as a father would, and from my birth I guided the widow, if I have seen anyone perishing for lack of clothing, or the needy without garments, and their hearts did not bless me for warming them with the fleece of my sheep, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless, knowing that I had influence in court, then let my arm fall from the shoulder, let it be broken off at the joint. For I dreaded destruction from God, and for fear of His splendor I could not do such things. If I have put my trust in gold, or said, to, or said to pure gold, you are my security. If I have rejoiced over my great wealth, the fortune my hands had gained. If I have regarded the sun and its radiance, or the moon moving in splendor, so that my heart was, was secretly enticed, and my hand offered them a kiss of homage then these also would be sins to be judged, for I would have been unfaithful to God on high. If I have rejoiced at my enemy's misfortune, or gloated over the trouble that came to him, I have not allowed my mouth to sin by invoking a curse against their life. If those of my household have never said, who has not been filled with Job's meat, but no stranger had to spend the night in the street, for my door was always open to the traveler. If I have concealed my sin as people do by hiding my guilt in my heart because I so feared the crowd and so dreaded the contempt of the clans that I kept silent and would not go outside. Oh, that I had someone to hear me. I sign now my defense. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser put his indictment in writing. Surely I would wear it on my shoulder. I would put it on like a crown. I would give him an account of my every step. I would present it to him as to a ruler. If my land cries out against me, and all its furrows are wet with tears, if I have devoured its yields without payment, or broken the spirit of its tenants, then let briars come up instead of wheat, and stink wheat instead of barley. The words of Job are ended. These are the last words that Job speaks until chapter 42, uh, when God is finished speaking. You could call this chapter Job's final defense. Up until this point, his three friends have been accusing him of committing sin. And Job has responded by defending himself. He's been declaring his innocence, that he is not guilty of any of the crimes that his friends have been accusing him of. He's not guilty of any crime that warrants the kind of suffering he is experiencing. In chapter 27, verse 5 to 6, he says, I will never admit you are in the right, speaking to his three friends. Till I die, I will not deny my integrity. I will maintain my innocence and never let go of it. Job has his mind made up here. He's innocent and he is not changing his story. He is never going to let go of his innocence. You're not going to convince him ever that he has sinned, that he's made a mistake warranting this kind of suffering. He's 100% confident of his innocence. And he is so confident that he says things like, if I have been dishonest or spoken deceitfully, in verse 8, then may others eat what I have sown, and may my crops be uprooted. 
As we read in chapter 31 also in the area of lust and sexuality, Job, he had kept himself pure. He hadn't lusted after anyone else, hadn't been knocking on the door of his neighbor's house. And he said, uh, he was so confident, uh, he was so confident of his purity, his faithfulness to his wife, that he said, uh, if he's done anything wrong in any way in this area, verse 10, then may my wife grind another man's grain, and may other men sleep with her. He goes on to say that if I have neglected the needs of those who are in need, if I have neglected the orphan, uh, verse 22, then let my arm fall from the shoulder, let it be broken off at the joint. Uh, this would be kind of like if you and a friend were in a debate and you said to your friend, if I'm wrong, I'll give you my vehicle. Or, if I'm wrong, you can have my house. You would have to be pretty sure of yourself that you are in the right in order to say something like that. Well, that's what Job is doing here. He is so certain he is in the right that he is willing to take a stand and say things like this. He's 100% sure he's innocent. In the beginning of the book of Job, he's described as a man who's blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Job is innocent, and he knows it too. He knows it. And this leads Job to a place of confusion. He's confused about what's going on here. He's confused because he's suffering tremendously. God is causing him to suffer. And why? He's confused about what God is doing, what God is up to. The Lord said, and this is in the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verse 8 to 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Sometimes it simply doesn't make sense why God is doing what he is doing. Job is finding himself in that place right now. And for us, Job didn't have Isaiah 55, verse 8 to 9, but for us we know his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts. He is not thinking the same things we are. In the case of Job, he cannot make sense of why God is allowing him to suffer. It makes no sense to him. He's done everything right, uh, but it says, if God is against him, that's the way he feels. He feels that God has turned his back on him, that God is actually, in, in a sense, his enemy. In chapter 19, verse 6, he says, know that God has wronged me and drawn his net around me. It is as if Job finds himself in his mind, in his mind he finds himself locked away in a prison of suffering. And he's innocent, he knows he's innocent, but he's in that prison, he's in that jail cell, knowing he's innocent, he's done nothing wrong to deserve being there, and yet he knows God has put him there. And this is why he says, God has wronged me. He's put me in this prison of suffering, and I'm not guilty. I shouldn't be here, but God has put me here. And it's because the uh, Job, it's because he's feeling this way that he is wrestling with uh, certain issues. Namely, uh, the justice of God. He is not only suffering uh, the loss of his children and all that, he's also suffering the way that he is suffering, to go back to the words of Paul Tripp, he is suffering his understanding of the way God works. The justice of God. Job, he's in a prison of suffering. He's done nothing wrong, yet God has put him there. And this leads him to ask the question, to wrestle with the question, is God just? Is he just? In chapter 27, verse 2, he says, As surely as God lives, who has denied me justice, the Almighty, who has made my life bitter. In Job's mind, God is not treating him fairly. He's denying him justice. Which Job, he's in his mind, he deserves justice. He wants justice. But God isn't being fair and he's denying him all of that. In chapter 10, verses 2 to 3, he says, I say to God... Do not declare me guilty, 
But tell me what charges you have against me. Does it please you to oppress me, to spurn the work of your hands, while you smile on the plans of the wicked? He's saying, don't declare me guilty. He's crying out from that prison. I, what have you got against me, God, that you have put me here? Uh, it would seem to me here in, in uh, verses 2 and 3 that Job, he's actually crossed a line. It is one thing to not understand what God is doing and to express that to him and just simply say, God, I have no clue what in the world you're doing. This doesn't make sense at all here. But it's another thing to actually accuse him of smiling on the plans of the wicked. Now, perhaps this is just hyperbole on Job's part as he expresses his frustration over the fact that there doesn't seem to be any justice in the world. But he, does, he accuses the Lord of smiling on the plans of the wicked. I think to some extent we can identify with Job in this way. Maybe not we saying the exact same thing, but sometimes you look out in the world and it just doesn't make sense. The wicked, they seem to be doing rather well. Maybe not even the wicked, but just unbelievers. They seem to be going through life great. Everything is going well. They're successful. They're making lots of money, driving fancy cars, living in a nice house. And then there is the Christian suffering, the one who is trying to do the Lord's work, the one who is trying to do what's right, they're falling behind. They're not doing well, but the one who's being deceitful and so on, they seem to be doing just great. And we look at it and we go, where in the world is the justice here? What's going on, God? I mean, if anything, it's the bad people. They're the ones who are supposed to be suffering, not the good people. We haven't done anything to deserve suffering. This is the kind of issue that the psalmist wrestled with. In this case, not King David, but actually Asaph. He said this, this is Psalm 73, verses 3 to 5, as well as 12 to 14. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Verses 12, and four, uh, 12 to 14. This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care. They go on amassing wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishment. What's the point of following God? This is almost kind of like what the psalmist is asking here. Why? You don't seem to get ahead doing it. And this is kind of what Job is wrestling with. He's been innocent, and for what? He hasn't done anything wrong, but for what? Uh, the wicked, they're getting ahead. The Lord, as far as Job is concerned, he's smiling on the plans of the wicked. Meanwhile, he's locked up in a prison of suffering. So what is the point? I don't get the impression uh, throughout the book of Job that Job ever questions the sovereignty of God. He knows that God is in charge. He knows that God controls all things. He knows that God has brought the suffering upon him. He doesn't wrestle with the sovereignty of God. He fully believes in that. What he does wrestle with, what he does call into question, is God's goodness. And when we make the charge that God has wronged us, as Job did, that's really what we're doing. We're calling into question his goodness, but we're calling it into question his wisdom. Does he really know what he's doing? Yes, he's in charge, but there's no justice around here. Does he know what he's doing? Is he really good? After all, if God is not just, he can't be good. A judge who just lets people, criminals off the hook, you wouldn't call him a good judge. If God is not just, it follows he's not good. Job is calling into question God's goodness, his wisdom. And what is to be said about this? What do we do with Job's perspective here? There's one character from the book of Job that we have not considered yet. 
We've been introduced to God, Satan, Job, Job's wife, Job's three friends. One final character, and that is Elihu. He doesn't come into the picture until chapter 32, actually. We don't hear about him until this point. He's a young fellow, a young whippersnapper. He's younger than Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz. Uh, that's why he's actually kept quiet up until this point. Uh, he viewed himself as being younger, and so he was going to let the older and the wiser people uh, get a say in. He began his uh, six-chapter long discourse. He goes on for six chapters, actually, by acknowledging uh, that that was the case. He said in verse 6 to 9, I am young in years, and you are old. That is why I was fearful, not daring to tell you what I know. I thought age should speak, advanced years should teach wisdom. But it is the spirit in a person, the breath of the Almighty, that gives them understanding. It is not only the old who are wise, not only the aged who understand what is right. Elihu here, he is an example of the fact that age and wisdom do not necessarily go hand in hand. We usually like to think the older, the wiser. That is not necessarily the case. It is possible to be old and foolish. It is also possible to be young and wise. And in this case, Eliphaz, sorry, pardon me, Elihu, he is wiser than his, the Job's three friends uh, who were speaking before him. And Elihu, he was upset with everyone, with the exception of God. Uh, you know, Job, Job was upset with God. He was upset with his three friends. His three friends were upset with him. We learn later on in the book that uh, God, he was upset with Job's three friends. Uh, people are upset with, uh, all day, with everyone throughout the book here. Elihu, he is upset, and not with God, but he is upset with Job's three friends, and he is upset with Job. We don't know how long he has been sitting there listening to this conversation. We're not told when exactly he came and sat down with them. But for as long as he has been listening to them, he hasn't been very impressed by what he's been hearing. And so he comes in, uh, he comes in just swinging, and he's, and he's upset with Job's three friends, he's upset with Job. And we're going to consider actually here the fact that he is upset with Job. Not so much Job's three friends, but just Job. And he gets angry with Job, in particular, uh, not for any sin, that Job has committed, that has led to his suffering, but for the things that he has been saying while he has been suffering. Uh, it is possible that our sin might not lead to the suffering that we are experiencing, but in the midst of our suffering, uh, we can sin by the things we say, and in the case of Job, by what he accuses God of. Job 32 and verse 2. But Elihu, son of Barakel, the Buzzite of the family of Ram, became very angry with Job for justifying himself rather than God. Job, he was very busy justifying himself, pointing to the fact that he is innocent, pleading his case that he has done nothing wrong. But he did not defend God. He didn't justify God at all. He actually accused God of doing him wrong. And this is what Elihu is really frustrated with here. It's as if he's looking to Job and saying, Job, you've got to be kidding me. You are going to accuse God of doing wrong? That's not right. In chapter 34, verses 10 to 12, he says, So listen to me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God to do evil, from the Almighty to do wrong. He repays everyone for what they have done. He brings on them what their conduct deserves. It is unthinkable that God would do wrong, that the Almighty would pervert justice. Elihu says it is unthinkable that God would do wrong. It's unthinkable that he would be unjust. He's always just. And Job, he's just a little speck of dust on planet Earth that's floating around out in the universe, and he's going to accuse God of being unjust. The one who knows all things, the one who created all things, he's all-powerful, all-wise. 
Job is going to accuse him of being wrong. Warren Wearsby, he said, If God is truly God, then he is perfect. And if he is perfect, then he cannot do wrong. An unjust God would be as unthinkable as a square circle or a round square. It is important for us to recognize when we find ourselves in the valley of suffering that there exists the temptation to become angry with God. To start showing cynicism towards Him. This is where we find Job. He's not happy with God here. Originally he said, the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away, may the name of the Lord be praised. Now he says, where is God's justice? He's, he's put me in this prison of suffering. He has wronged me. His attitude has changed. But what right do we have to be angry with God? It can be easy to be angry with Him, but what right do we have? God did not wrong Job. And God did not wrong us. He never does wrong us. It is unthinkable that God would do wrong, that the Almighty would pervert justice, as Elihu said. God, He is not in the wrong. He knows what He's doing. He loves us, and He'll only ever do what He, in His perfect wisdom, thinks is best for us. It would seem to me that if the reality of God's goodness had been pressed upon Job's heart, if he knew in his heart that God was good. That would have gone a long way in helping to relieve him of his suffering. Yes, he still would have experienced the suffering, the grief over losing his children, his livestock, his servants, his health. He would have still walked through all of that. But his suffering was made all the more worse because of the fact that the goodness of God that was something that he was really wrestling with here. He wasn't convinced God was good. He wasn't convinced that God knew what he was doing. He wasn't convinced that God was just. His suffering it could have been greatly reduced. And ours can be too. Uh, when we remember that God does not wrong us, he is for us, he is with us, if you lose sight of the fact when you are suffering, if you lose sight of the fact that God is good, that He's for you, He's not against you, you are then in a very difficult spot. In times of suffering, the best thing we can do is run to the Lord. But how do you run to the Lord when you are convinced that He has wronged you, when you're convinced that He is not for you, that He is in fact against you, that he is not good and that he doesn't know what he is doing. It's very difficult to go to him with that mentality, with that thinking. But when we are in suffering, if we can remember that God hasn't wronged us, that he is just, that he knows what he's doing, that he is good, that will go a long way in helping us through the valley of suffering. It would have helped Job out a lot. It would have helped him a lot. And it will most certainly help us as we go through suffering in our own lives. Let's pray. Lord, we know that sometimes we walk through difficulty. As Job did, Lord, we walk through dark seasons as well of suffering. But we thank you that you are still good. You are good before we suffer. You're good while we suffer. When we're in the suffering, you're always good. That doesn't change. You're always looking out for us. You always care about us. You don't wrong us. I pray that you would help us to remember that. Help us to remember that you are for us, that you're not against us, that you're always with us. You never leave us. You never forsake us. That you, in your perfect and infinite wisdom, know what is best for us. Help us. Help us to have a greater understanding of who you are. Not just a head knowledge either, but just a heart understanding. May we know deep down inside that you are good, that you love us, that you care about us. 
And we pray this in your name. Amen.